Welcome, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. If you're new here, uh, my name is Pastor Chris, and you've come in, in, the, in, in towards the beginning of our current series called The Fruit, The Whole Fruit and Nothing But The Fruit. Basically, I'd like you to imagine that you're in a courtroom and you've been charged with having the fruit of the Spirit. And the way you're going to be found guilty or not guilty is going to be by the testimony of those who give evidence for or against you. And so normally in a court of law, you would, if you're pleading, you would plead not guilty because you would want to be found innocent and move on. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we want to determine when looking at the fruit of the Spirit, are we showing that in, the, in our lives and so that we would be able to plead guilty as charged? And so we're looking in two passages for this series, uh, John 15, 1 to 15, and Galatians 5, 22 to 23. That is where the actual fruit of the Spirit is found. Now what we learned last week, we looked at the first fruit, which is love. And we learned from John 15, 1 to 15, that Jesus is the vine and God is the vine dresser. And today we're going to be looking at joy. And joy is, is hard to explain. You know, we'd like to look at what's the difference between happiness and joy. So what that difference is, is what we're going to look at today. Now, I'm sure you know by this time that last week, the church that Fran and I left to come here to Echo Valley Church called Impact Church in Chester County, they decided for their mission project this year to send a group of people up here for a week and help do projects around the church. They were doing this as a love offering. This was showing the love we talked about last week. So make sure you go around the building and check out some of the things that were done. We have some slides, and as we run through the slides as I'm talking, you're going to see uh, people coming together. They were doing painting. We had to put new piping of our downspouts out there. We redid the bathrooms. We had electrical work done. The list just goes on. And as you go through the slides and as they play behind me, you can see the different ways that Impact Church made an impact here at Echo Valley. So when we look at love, the love the Lord, we're called to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and spirit, and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's first meant for us as fellow believers within each other, and then it's for our fellow man. So Impact Mission Week was a perfect example of that. It was love in action. As a Christian, our love should be as clear to see as our hair color, or the color of our eyes. It is a natural result of being connected to Christ. It should happen without trying. And joy is similar as well. So how can we show our love and our joy? Well, it was evident by the team that came up here to serve, they showed their love for Fran and I, as well as you, as their sister church. It was all about relationships. And as you can see from the slides behind me, there was lots of time for fellowship. Young teenagers were here working and putting in labor, a labor of love here from this church, working along with Impact. We had fellowship over meals. There was just time to come together as God's family. And even though we were two different churches, we showed the love of Christ to each other. There are more slides on Facebook, so make sure you get a chance, if you get a chance, to check them out. So as we begin to look at joy, consider this. Happiness is because of, and joy is in spite of. So starting and looking again in John 15, 1 to 15, let's look at verse 2 of John 15. It reads this way. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't or does not produce fruit. And so point one would be the living dead, removing dead wood. It says that he cuts off every branch 
that doesn't produce fruit. We said last week that fruit is a natural product of being connected to the vine. So what does it mean he will cut off the non-producing dead branches? Well, there's a parable told by Jesus in Matthew 13, verses 3 to 9, about a farmer who is planting and he's throwing seed, and the seed lands on different types of soil. The first soil is a footpath, and when the seed is thrown on there, the birds come and they eat it up because it cannot get down because the dirt is crushed and pushed down too much for anything to get into it. The second example was shallow soil, but under the soil were rocks. And so it, it sprouted quickly, but then withered and died because the roots could not take because of the rocks underneath. The third area that he threw seed uh, grew up with thorns that choked out the tender plants. And the fourth area that was sown was fertile soil and it produced a large crop. So recently we had work done at our house and they seeded the ground and then they put some straw on top of that seed to protect the seed from the birds. It matters where the seed goes and whether it can be born again and grow. So then Jesus gives his disciples the meaning of that parable in verses 18 to 23 of chapter 13 of Matthew, and it reads this way. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. And then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. So what can we, what can we get from that? So God, as the vine dresser, will remove any dead, dead branch that isn't bearing fruit. Now John MacArthur says, that these branches are a picture of apostate Christians who never genuinely believed and will be taken away in judgment. The transforming life of Christ has never pulsated within them. Now, from a horticultural aspect, dead branches can have disease and decay. And if left untrimmed, the vine will develop long, rambling branches that produce little fruit because most of the strength of the vine is given to growing wood and therefore the vine dresser removes the dead wood from his church. So let's read the rest of verse 2. We'll start again at the beginning. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. So point two is addition through subtraction, potential for more. As a believer in Christ, we are joint heirs with Christ. We are children of God. And when we are connected to the vine and the Holy Spirit is flowing through us, we will naturally produce fruit. This is something that is involuntary. We can't make it happen. So how should we see the pruning process? Well, if we look at a verse in Hebrews 12, 5 to 8, it reads this way. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father. If God doesn't discipline you as he does his, all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. 
So why do we as earthly parents discipline our children? We do it to instill obedience, wisdom, accountability, humility, and respect and love. As children of God, we should welcome times of trials that show us and show we belong to God as our Father. God desires for us to focus on him, which therefore creates a stronger connection, which in turn creates more fruit to show we belong to him. So now let's look at another verse in John 15 about joy. And point three is remaining in his love produces inexpressible joy. The verse, fi- verse 11, chapter 15, verse 11 reads this way. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. First Peter 1, 8 and 9 reads this way. You love him even though you have never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. John Piper defines joy in this way. A good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. So let's break that down for a second. A good feeling. It's not an idea, a conviction, a persuasion, or a decision. It's a feeling or emotion. You can't control, or I I rather would like to say, you don't have control over how you feel about something. It just happens to you. It's also in in the soul. That means it's not in the body. Your body, if affected, but it isn't the source. Your body may be affected, but it isn't the source. It comes from the soul, which impacts virtue, which what is right, what is wrong. Next, he said, it's produced by the spirit. Well, the fruit we know comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes through the branch, which is connected to the vine. We being the branch, Christ being the vine. The Holy Spirit is what runs through us and helps us produce that fruit. He goes on to say, it causes us to see the beauty of Christ. We ask God to open the eyes of our heart. And he said, we see him in his word and the world. His word in nature, works in people, etc. So when we consider joy as a fruit of the spirit, we should not focus too much on the one fruit, but in the entirety of the fruit. So as we are transformed, we will exhibit the fruit naturally. As we need to exhibit any individual fruit, God will prune us to produce more and better fruit. Charles Stanley speaks of this in his Life Principles Bible. He said that we should not focus too heavily on any one fruit too much. We will identify a fruit that we need to improve and work on it and work on it and then identify another in need of improvement and work on it. This causes us to disregard the work of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit is from the Spirit as the producer. We are merely the bearers. The fruit of the Spirit was never intended to demonstrate our dedication and resolve. Rather, it reveals our dependency on and our sensitivity to the promptings of the Spirit. The fruit we display for others to see is a result of our connection to the Spirit and Jesus. It happens naturally. It cannot be produced by our hard work or intentionally. So, what does inexpressible joy look like? What is the difference between happiness and joy? How do I know if I am joyful? In our culture today, joy and happiness are used interchangeably. But I think we know the difference between the two. We are talking about biblical joy. Let's look at some common types of joy. How about times of celebration? Weddings, a birth of a baby, graduation. How about a job promotion or an award for a job well done? That would cause us joy, but that's a common type of joy. 
How about a time of achievement? You graduate from college or you finish a difficult job. You've been trying to lose weight and you reached your number that you wanted to get to. Weight loss. Or how about just ending a bad habit that you've been struggling with? How about in relationships with your spouse, your child, or a friend? You can have joy with them. There's unexpected joy, like you get an inheritance that you didn't know you were getting, or rebate that you get back from your taxes, or a refund on something that you paid. That would bring unexpected joy, something you didn't plan on happening. And then there's just life joy, life itself. You know, there are non-Christians that are joyful, in some instances, they're even more joyful than Christians. But without the joy of the Lord, people are really inwardly miserable. You know, happiness is a choice. People do choose happiness, but still do not attain it. They choose inner peace and joy in the wrong places, through materialism, sexual situations, positions of power. You put, you put it, add it to the list. But biblical joy is different. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Joy is what God wants us to have, his joy. Theologian William Barclay says, it is not the joy that comes from earthly things, still less from triumphing over someone else in competition. It's a joy whose foundation is God. The joy comes from the relationship with Jesus the one who is able to give us an eternal perspective no matter what our, our circumstances. So in what ways can we experience this type of joy? Well, experiencing joy in the scriptures. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. Is that how you feel when you read God's word? That you just devour the words that are in there? That you actually have a book that has God's words in there? And you have the ability to read them? That should be a joy that fills your heart with delight. Psalm 119, 162 says, I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. Is that how you see God's word? like it's a treasure, like it's a, you, you can't put a price on it. You can't put a value on it. It's too great. Does it give you great joy to read the very words of God written just for you? That should be an emotion that is straight from the soul. Another way of experiencing joy would be in worship. Experiencing joy in worship. Psalm 100, 1 to 3 says, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Do you experience joy as you worship the God of the universe? Do you feel the emotion what, of what you are singing? Does it go all the way to your soul? Remember, I gave you the image that what we do here is practice for when we are in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, will you stand there and not participate when in his presence? Or will you shout to the Lord with all your being? Another way to experience his joy is in his presence. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. You know, it's no accident that I'm including different psalms to show what joy should look like. The psalmist knew what it was like to have joy from his word in worship, and especially David, who spent many hours in his presence out watching the sheep. Spending time with him in his word, in prayer, in fellowship with him, is being in his presence. The mere thought that you can have that access should fill you with so much joy you can barely contain yourself. You know, Fran and I are passionate people. We feel deeply, we laugh heartedly, we love completely, and we cry regularly. If you were here over this past week when Impact Church was here and our friends came up, you may have confused tears of joy for tears of sadness. Fran regularly felt such gratitude for all the people who came to serve the church 
and us. She was asked if she was sad. So joy can show itself even through tears. David calls for dancing. Raised hands exhibit awe and praise and love and thankfulness. The question remains, are we to be happy all the time, to be joyful? No, but it should be something that never leaves you because it's not tied to our circumstances. Happiness is because and joy is in spite of. We can also experience joy in hardship. All right, Pastor Chris, how can we be called to have joy during trials and hardship? Well, Romans 5, 3 to 5 states it this way. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You know, I was reading a story recently about this man who was on a hike, and as he was walking through the woods, he, he spied this cocoon on the branch of a tree. And he was really intrigued about this cocoon, and so he decided to cut off a piece of the branch with the cocoon on and take it home with him. And he set it up under a lamp, and he watched it over a few days. And finally, at one point, the cocoon started to move. And whatever was inside of it was rooching and turning and struggling to, to come out of the cocoon. And finally, it started to open, and he could see that inside was a moth, a huge emperor moth, and it tr was struggling and struggling to get out of this cocoon. It, it had created a hole in the end, and it was just trying to push through the end. And the man thought, surely he's never going to be able to get through that small hole. So I will help him. And he took an implement and he cut the cocoon and released the moth from the cocoon. Unfortunately, the moth came out disfigured because its wings were flat against its body. Because what happens with an emperor moth as they struggle to get out of a cocoon and they push through that tiny little hole it forces the blood and forces the fluid back and into the wings. So this unfortunate emperor moth had to spend the rest of his life just crawling around, unable to fly. So when we look at that, we, we can apply that to ourselves that sometimes the struggle is just what we need. Sometimes the struggle is just what we need. James 1, verses 2 to 3, say, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. You know, endurance is being able to trust, stick with, and be patient, waiting for what God wants to teach you. Charles Stanley used to say, it is our response to adversity that is more important than the adversity itself. If God is pruning, trying to get our attention so we will grow closer to him in faith, trust, and love, then the way we, res we respond will lessen the trial as we gain the desired adjustment he wants to make in our lives. So we need to ask, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? You know, it's, it's ironic, Philippians is the most joyful book in the Bible, but it was written by Paul from prison. He writes in Philippians 1, 3 to 6, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So the last way I'd like to speak today about how we can experience joy is in our salvation, experiencing joy in salvation. Are you joyful about your salvation? 
is there anything life can bring you as great as the gift of your salvation? This should cause all of us to stand in awe with raised hands, humble hearts, and joy that is inexpressible. Psalm 51, 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. And Philippians 4, 4 from the New American Standard Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Can you walk that way in your life? Are you able in all circumstances to have joy? Remember, happiness, we decide whether we're going to be happy about something. Joy is something we have in spite of our circumstances, in spite of what's happening. Can we find that joy of God in anything that's happening, and especially when we're having adversity and we're having hardship? Can we find the joy in there, recognizing that God is trying to do something in our lives and prune us and make us bear more fruit, become more like him, and be able to affect more people? The fruit of the Spirit is not for us. First, it's to give, bring glory to God. And secondly, it's to, to bless those around us. So as he prunes us and our fruit becomes greater and it is evident to the people that see us, they were going to testify in court on your behalf that yes, you have the fruit of the spirit. You have love. You have joy. So I want to ask you today in closing, where does your joy come from? Do you have biblical joy that isn't subject to your circumstances? Go away this week and remember happiness is because of, but joy is in spite of. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for these, these passages on bearing your fruit and how that is done by staying as a branch connected to the vine. And Lord, joy is such a, an amazing thing. It is something that we need to learn that should happen and it supersedes anything else that's going on. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is determined by our circumstances, but joy Joy should be part of us at all times. It should be in spite of anything that's happening in our lives. And it is a joy that everyone else should see and want to be attracted to and find out where our joy comes from. It's because you are our God and you've sent your son as our savior. And because of that, the fruit is coming out of us. Lord, thank you for this series as we look to see the things that should be coming from us naturally because of our connection to you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.